So let's turn our attention to this challenging task of computing that amplitude. And then we'll take the mod squared eventually to finish this computation. Here, as I said, it's a very complicated operator to tackle with. So we will look for an approximation technique. And the approximation technique is the so-called electric dipole approximation. Well, it's not obvious in a few mo when once we start why this name is given to it. But eventually, you are going to see the reason why that name is actually given to that approximation. But let's work out the approximation first, based on physical grounds. And then let's see whether we can justify the name. Well, the major issue is that that operator is a very complicated operator. So if we can replace it with a simpler thing, well, what is the simplest thing? The identity operator directly, then life becomes very easy. Let's see why we can, under certain circumstances, we can replace this horrendous operator with the identity operator directly. Let's work it out first. This operator, in order to give it a meaning, you have to expand it in the infinite series expansion. That is what it means, right? Directly, m dot x plus i squared over 2 factorial omega over c squared m dot x squared, etc. So there are infinitely many terms of that sort. So when you are computing this, in order to see how we work this out, let's insert here an identity. The identity is the completeness sum, right? Say m and m. So if I write it as m and e to the i omega over c, n dot x, m, and m, epsilon dot p and i. Well, this portion, we cannot do much. We are going to retain it. But in this portion, in this factor, we have that infinite series sandwich between n and m. So when you sandwich this between n and m, in the right hand side, you have a term of the order 1, delta nm term, plus the second term will be i omega over c, n dotted into n x m, and the, all the others are according to omega over c squared times the square of that expectation value, etc. It goes on all the way to infinity. So this first factor is explicitly written a term of order 1 and a term like this and a term like the square of it. So let me first estimate the first term. Estimation of the first term requires that you need to know what? You need to know omega over c times what is the order of magnitude value of this expectation value, it should be of the atomic size, right? When you take any, any x component and compute in an atomic state, you should get the size of the atom up to factors of one half or square root of one, whatever. So it is the R atom. So this second term is proportional to omega over c times R atom. And the next term is proportional to omega over c squared times r atom squared and etc. That's the way. So that's the systematics of how the infinite series goes all the way to, to the des desired order. So what I would like to estimate now is what is this omega over c r atom? You see it's so powerful an argument. What is this? Can we estimate this? Well, of course we can. Based on the following very simple reasoning. Here is the EI and EN. The, the 
two levels in question involving the absorption process. The light is coming in, absorbed by this level and raised to an excited level. What is the energetics of this simple diagram? The simple diagram is that the delta E, the gap between these two characteristic levels, is, should be of the same order as h bar omega because that's the energy brought in by the photon. If the energy is sufficient to cause that transition, then it is that expression. Well, why that argument is, although very, very simple, crucial, well, you know, there are discrete levels in the atoms, right? There is a minimum to that gap. For example, if this is the two neighboring levels, say if this is the ground state and that's the first excited level, there are no other states in between. So that's the next. So the minimum is this. The maximum is the ionization energy, right, all the way to to release the electron freely. So there is a sort of a minimum and maximum for this. Minimum because you, you have minimum, a certain amount of minimum between the ground and the next. And maximum because you don't want to ionize the atom. You want to keep the electron inside the atom. Make a transition, but not break it away. So that particular constraint is the reason why there is such a we need to match the energy. So let's work it out. What is this delta E typically? Well, the, according to the real theorem, the expectation values of the kinetic and the potential and total energies are proportional up to factors of one halves and twos, etc. right? So this is the same as, I can take it to be at the same order of magnitude as the E squared over our atom. Our atom is typical the size of the atom. What is the potential energy? E squared over R, right? So it is of the same order as the potential expectation value of the potential energy. E squared divided by a typical atomic scale, E squared over R atom. Beautiful. After this, as I said, although it's very simple, still so powerful that once you write this, which is easily acceptable, right? There's nothing to it. Then rest is essentially trivial. If I move this h bar in here and write it as e squared over h bar and even multiply it with 1 over c, what you have in the right hand side is r atom times omega over c. These additional c's are put in by hand in both sides. And left hand side is the alpha, right hand side is r atom times omega over c. You see how fast we have reached that condition. Omega over C, our atom should be, the product should be order of alpha. Then, this is one, the series goes like the following. One plus order alpha plus the next is order alpha squared, etc. Alpha is less than 1%, right? 1 over 137. And the square of it, further 1 over 2 factorial is also coming in. It is 1 over 137 squared times 1 over 2. So it's less than 1 part in 10,000. Less than 1 part in, probably 1 part in 20,000. So if you're not requiring a precision of less than 1%, then if you're, the kind of uh, argument if doesn't force you to go to that order, if 10 percentage type of approximation is sufficient, then you can even neglect this one because 1 over 137. So you can say if you don't want that precision, you can drop all these and retain only the identity and that is the regime in which you call electric dipole approximation. It's an approximation regime, not the entire thing. You can, of course, try to solve it exactly. You'll see that in certain circumstances you can solve it exactly. But here, to have a quick, a quick result, and you say my computations do not require that precision, you replace the first exponential factor with the identity, and then proceed. So that's the name for the electric dipole approximation. So electric 
dipole approximation is e to the i omega over c n dot x is the identity we write it to be on the safe side to show what we are neglecting you retain the identity first and all the rest you drop if that is the case that matrix element is then n electric dipole approximation regime of course n epsilon dot p and i this is very simple well not the simplest thing that we can have but as compared to the original one this is a very simple expression therefore we will pursue our discussion from this point on in this manner well p is the gradient operator right epsilon dot p so computing the expectation values of a grad gradient operator is complicated so you may wish to move to x from here how do you do that well first of all choose epsilon the polarization to be parallel to the x-axis it's not without losing the generality it, it, it doesn't do any harm so if that is the case then this becomes px only because the polarization is provided by the external agent you say let's take it to be in the x you define your x-axis to be parallel to the given external polarization it is you are free to orientate your axis any way you like so it is the px's expectation value that i'm computing how do i relate it to x expectation value for instance obviously x expectation value is so much simpler than computing the expectation value of the px for that let me consider this commutator h0 is the original h0 it is the p squared over 2m plus the coulomb potential so coulomb potential is the function of x therefore it commutes with the x it is the only p squared part which gives you non non-trivial contribution x and p squared divided by 2m right this one Ad additional potential just commutes obviously and what is this it is the 1 over 2m times the x with the p squared it gives you what x px px to the right x px to, px to the left so 1 over 2m x px is i h bar there is the 2 px so 2 and 2 cancels saying you have i h bar over m px well that's a beautiful although very simple a beautiful identity because that tells you that px operator can be expressed as m over i h bar x with h0 some of you may say is this simpler than the px it is simpler than the px for the following reason it is this matrix element that we are computing and the matrix element involve i and n i and n are eigenstates of the h0 so therefore if you replace px with the commutator and you can make use of the fact that these are the eigen vectors of the h0 you'll see it's going to directly reduce to the matrix element of the x itself let me show it to you now okay so this one is equal to px is m over i h bar n x a zero i okay so it becomes this x times h zero minus h zero time x so it is EI minus EN times X inside. You take the pure number out. M over H, well, okay. M times EI minus EN divided by I H bar. Let me move the I in here. 
n x and i. You see, it is moving in the right direction. Indeed, only the expectation value of the x is appearing in here. What is this? E i minus E n divided by h bar omega i n or minus omega n i. So this one is minus omega n i if n is the first, but this is i is the first, therefore that's the reason why there's a minus sign. That minus enables you to move the i up. It becomes i m omega n i n x n i. So this is the this is the p p x indeed f n i. Yeah, f and I. Really simple. Therefore, we can write, now write the expression. That expression as follows: sigma absorption. Four pi squared alpha h bar divided by m squared omega times the matrix element squared. Let me write that line first, if you want. Fni squared times the energy conserving delta. What is this Fni squared? It is the square of this thing, mod squared. m squared, m squared, omega ni squared times n x i squared the energy conserving delta. M squared cancels. So you have 4 pi squared alpha times h bar omega n i squared divided by omega n squared energy conserving delta. What is the energy conserving delta? It's E n minus E i minus h bar omega. E n minus E i minus h bar omega. E n minus E i is h bar omega n i. Right, that's the definition of omega n i, the gap, energy gap written in terms of the frequency. So it is h bar omega n i minus omega. Using the scale property of the delta, the h bar comes out as 1 over h bar delta omega n i minus omega. That h bar cancels the h bar up there. And the presence of delta omega n i minus omega tells you that the only place they appear they should be equal otherwise when omega n i different than omega, it's zero anyway. So it becomes then 4 pi squared alpha omega n i times n x i squared times the frequency conserving omega now. That is omega n i minus omega. So it is the absorption cross section. So that's all the way we come to, to this through a monochromatic plane wave, single, single photon. Now let's move to the more realistic case that it is the ideal single photon case is not that practical, no practically feasible. So you have beam of light or a stream of photons and all broaden around the single omega, either Lorentzian or Gaussian way, as Kamil was mentioning at the break. So this is technically how it, all these things are working. So I have, let's include that, take that into account. 
So what we do then is we have to sum over this sigma absorption, which is the function of frequency, over that narrow band of frequencies, to, uh, and we have to sum over the final states n. It was originally single i to single n transition, but when you are considering the possibility of there's a beam and there's a sort of broadening of the frequency of the incoming beam of light, then of course it may cause transitions to the neighboring, neighboring states. It's not energetics only, and there's a multitude of the final states. So this is moving from ideal to the technically feasible case, and it becomes a little complicated then in that case. You'll see the consequences of it at the end of the day. When it was single photon, it was very quantum. But when you are bringing in the possibility of a stream of photons, there is a, a large number of photons involved. Of course, the quantum effects will be washed out. And we'll get a result which is semi-classical. So I give you the final answer at the beginning why you get a semi-classical result at the end of the day. Individual, individual events are quantum mechanical when you put many of them together. The many means large many, 10 to the 23 perhaps, right, depending on the luminosity of the external light. So let's sum over that. However small the interval is, doesn't matter. Now it requires that you're uh, summing over. Summing in this case is integrating over the omega, the total. There is an n summation uh, for the final. The omega and the summation of this expression. So 4 pi squared alpha n x i squared delta <coughs> omega n i minus omega. And I dropped, I guess, uh, omega n i in here. Sorry, I have to move this a bit. 4 pi squared alpha omega n i, right? Yes. Sure. Okay, that's a very good question. You see there's a delta in here, right? It, this is zero when omega n i is different than omega. That's the definition of the Dirac delta. The only place when it's non-zero is that it is zero. The difference is zero. There's omega n i is equal to omega. Then you cancel part of the omega, convert it to omega n i. But then we need to eliminate Dirac delta as well? No, Dirac delta is there, sitting there. It's forcing you to identify them together because it is only when the argument is zero, close to zero. You are not eliminating it. That tells you that they should be the same. Because I am sitting in here, equate them all to each other. Okay. So what do I have then? I have to sum, carry out the integration. Thanks to the presence of this, this, then the integration is carried out and it becomes n four pi squared. Well, perhaps I can afford to step, move that constant out to make it more elegant looking. So this is the total, total because I've integrated over that narrow band of frequencies. This is the total uh, absorption cross-section. It looks nice, it looks complicated as well because there is an infinite sum in here principle, right? There are uh, n, what are those n's? They're in principle infinitely many. And computing all these individual matrix elements i to n and then taking the square and multiplying with the omega n i and summing over all n is again a very formidable task to say the least. Of course, some people, genius people, can solve, solve it exactly. And indeed, there is a nice algebraic way which is called, let me look at the names of those fellows, Thomas, Reich, and Kuhn, some rule. So we will use Thomas, Reich and Kuhn, some rule, and if I use their capital of their names, this is the TRK sum rule. Sum rule is the meaning that this is an algebraic technique. Instead of using the atomic uh, electronic states, computing expectation value for each, etc., 
we are not going to resort to the explicit forms of the atomic levels. We will solve it algebraically and directly. And these people uh, have really developed a beautiful uh, uh, argument. Let me show it to you as well. Now, what was it? I start with the... Let's give the proof. So let my next job is compute this algebraically. You may be wondering what algebra means in here. I will show you algebraically. And they start their construction by considering the following double commutator. H0, X, and X. Consider this. This double commutator. Not only H0, X, but take the further one more further commutator. Well, let's write this in two ways. First of all, what does it mean explicitly in terms of the definition of the commutators? And then next, let's compute it by computing H0x, we have done it before. So these, we will proceed in two ways and equate them together. You'll see that it's going to, well, it's an ingenious way, really, so simple. It's going to enable us to compute that infinite sum explicitly. So let me do that. The first is, what is the meaning of this as commutators? It is H bar 0x minus x H bar 0 times this and minus. Let me write that. So h by 0, x minus x, h by 0, x minus x, h 0, x minus x, h 0. That is nothing but writing what that commutator is, right, explicitly. So what you have from here is h 0, x squared, the first term, and there is also x squared, h 0 term from here. plus x0, h0, zero, x squared, h0. That is, I have taken them next to each other, and there are the crosses. Minus twice x, h0, x. I haven't done anything. Simple arithmetics, really, here. Good. That is the meaning, using just the meaning. Now let me compute them explicitly. What is h0, h0 x commutator? A zero x commutator is i h bar divided by the m x with a minus sign, right? Because it's x h zero. It's x h zero. H zero x is the opposite of it. So if goes there, i h bar over m times p x with a minus sign. Minus i h bar over m times p x. That's the first commutator. And let me compute the px with x once more. So it is minus i h bar over m times px with x is minus i h bar. Minus minus is plus i squared is minus. So it is altogether minus h bar squared over m, correct? This. That's the left-hand side. So I have, through this two-sided computation, I have the following identity. Let me write the identity, and let's see what we can do about that identity. So minus h bar squared over m times an identity, of course, when there is nothing as an operator equality, is equal to h0 x squared plus x squared h0 minus twice x h0x. That's the identity that we have obtained. A nice one, but as yet, you may be wondering what is it good for? Well, to answer that question, what is it good for? Again, for some ingenious reasons, the guys thought of take the take expectation value in R of both sides. That is, left-hand side is 
minus h bar squared over m i and identity and i, that's easy, the left hand side. And right hand side is i h0 x squared plus x squared h0 minus twice x h0 x and i. I'm, I'm just doing what I have said. Taking the expectation value of both sides in the initial state that we have started with. Well, identity is obviously nothing, and these are normalized eigenstates. Therefore, the left, this is 1. So the left-hand side is minus h bar squared over m, a pure number. What about the right-hand side? Let me compute these two groups separately. First of all, this is moving to the left gives you ei, and that's moving to the right, acting on i gives you another ei. So this thing is altogether twice ei x squared. As a first beautiful step, it is 2i x squared. So, let me write it. 2ei i x squared i. That's the first term simplified. Not to the final n, but simplified quite substantially. Minus this group. 2i x a0 x i. For the obvious reason, I have put some gaps between x, h0, and x. Insert a ident identity, a completeness sum here, and another completeness sum in here. m, m, sum over n, sum over m. And I will do the same here as well, split them into two and insert a complete, a complete completeness sum in between two, x times x. Okay, perhaps I will uh, move to the left. Let me move to the left. Minus h bar squared over m is equal to 2ei i x n n x i is the first term there. i x n x. Yes minus second is first of all perhaps I will uh, do, do carry out one one step in here it is the h0 sandwich between n and m so if I take this out it is em delta nm if I carry out the m summation using delta nm, I have minus twice n en i x n and n x on my. We are more or less done now. Let me move this in because it is independent of the n. I can freely move it in and out. Minus twice sum en minus ei times nxi times ixn, which is nxi conjugate. n x i mod squared. Well, this one is h bar omega n i. So altogether now, minus 2 h bar sum n 
omega n i n x i squared. Left hand side is minus h bar squared over m. So I can finish my computation now. Sum over n omega n i n x i squared is equal to h bar over 2m. Isn't this beautiful? Here, through this algebraic way, I have computed that explicit sum, infinite sum, and we came out to have the result in here. 4 pi squared alpha h bar over 2m. Finished. Not only it's finished in this simple manner, the, any trace of h bar will be cancelled. What do I mean? If I write this as, perhaps I can write it, the omega sigma absorption integrated total is 4 pi squared alpha is e squared over h bar c times h bar over 2m Notice that this h bar and <laughs> this h bar cancels. And you have the following. That 2 is also a cancel. 2 pi squared e squared. Sorry, e squared. And if I write one more c, and then this becomes 1 over mc squared, right? Indeed so. Two pi squared c times the classical radius of the electron. This classical radius of the electron is e squared over mc squared. So let me give you the numerical value of this if I can find it somewhere in here. Well, why it's called the classical radius of the electron? Obviously, it has some deep background in the classical electrodynamics. I don't know that much of it. Whether, you know, if you, uh, point-like electron is problematic, right? It's singular. If you would like to compute the mass of it using classical electrodynamics, then through the energy, through the electromagnetic field, it's created and, and it's interacting its self-interaction manner, and then you take the limit radius goes to zero, it's singular. That, that quant, sort of quantum electrodynamics type of singularity first originally met in the old times, some 70, 80 years ago, by the people of treating electron in a point-like manner. So they said to, not to get to that singularity that you have to uh, attribute a sort of classical radius, a sp small sphere, however small, but it must be a spherical shape instead of point-like. The numerical value of this thing is 2.82 10 to the minus 2.82 10 to the minus 13 centimeter or 10 to the fi minus 15 meter, right? So 10 to the minus 6 nanometers. So when you sometimes think that nano nano nanotechnology is a big deal, I can't afford to joke a little bit. You see, even at the classical level, you go six order magnitudes down. It's nice, huh? So, but the, the point is the following. Here, you have a essentially classical or semi-classical result. All of a sudden, although we have been carrying out a very quantum mechanical argument from the beginning, we were using time-dependent perturbation theory of quantum mechanics. And what is the symbol of quantum mechanics? So you get results depending on h bar, if it's a quantum mechanical result, right? And that's what distinguishes classical and quantum results from each other. But here, any reference to h bar is cancelled, and you have a semi-classical result. And this is due to the fact that instead of single photon, which was very quantum mechanical, then you have a collection of photons, which sometimes the typical number is 10 to the 23, right, Avogadro. Then uh, even, however, a smaller or dilute that you can get it, it can go up to 10 to the 15 or something, then the quantum effects are washed out apparently. 
But I don't know whether you enjoyed it or not. This was a beautiful exercise, actually. So we can now turn our attention to a related problem, which is the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric major difference between this particular one and the next one I will consider is, in, the, in these type of things, emission or stimulated emission or absorptions, you stay in the atom. You don't break the atom apart. You send some energy or light and it's excited, goes up to excited level, and then eventually it should go down, decay down to the, to the only stable state, which is the ground state, right? But now the photoelectric effect is different. Then you don't obey this constraint that the energy, incoming energy, should match, say, the gap, typical uh, gap of uh, electronic levels. It, if it doesn't respect that constraint, it may be larger than the largest possible level, which is the ionization energy, obviously. If it is larger than that, it's going to break the atom apart, or at least eject that particular electron if it is a large atom. And then the electron, the broken electron, moves away as a free particle after a few centimeters, obviously. And then by measuring its energy, as done in the, at the turn of the last century by Planck and Einstein and others, and they discovered that that energy, outgoing energy of the free electron is proportional to the incoming frequency, which was a, obviously a triggering point of the quantum theory. Let's analyze that problem in detail in this new context. Here is my symbolic atom, an electronic cloud, and a point like more or less at this level uh, nucleus. And there is a here is a, I consider schematically this is, has nothing to do with the reality, right? This is in, uh, in the uh, terminology of the young people a book. It's a picture. So there is a light coming in, and it's the energy is absorbed, so it's excited so much that it moves out broken away. That's the electron. So that's the photoelectric effect that we are considering. Now we are going to use the previous, we are going to take advantage of our previous expressions that we have developed. If I can find it, then I did so. Let me write the so-called absorption cross-section expression. Then I will modify it. Let me remind you the previous absorption cross-section expression, which was 4 pi squared. Well, I'm not, as I'm going to modify it, it's not absorption, obviously. It's something else. Therefore, just as a reminder, sigma absorption was 4 pi squared alpha times h bar divided by m squared omega times the n e to the i omega over c n dot x times epsilon dot p i squared. I'm not modifying anything yet, but I'll modify many of the things in here. So I'm just copying the absorption cross-section expression formula, and we'll start modifying it. This is the energy conserving. Dirac delta. Obviously, there are several things that I have to modify. Here it was a single I to single N transition because of this external light coming in. I was an electronic EI. This was EI, obviously. Electronic state. And N was another electronic state there, which it caused transition. But here, this is not an electronic uh, state anymore. It's a free electron state. So uh, let me start modifying it by denoting as f. N is n means discrete. We don't we don't want to use that in atomic discrete and, and energy level. It's a free 
free electron state. It moves as a freely. Now this was a single to single, obviously because of the presence of delta. Here I should consider the I should remember, I should watch out for the possibility that there will be more final states, very crowded, very large number of final states. Why is that so? What is the energy conservation? Again, okay, uh, replacing this with F, it may sound a bit naive for you that I'm just changing the notation from N to F. It's a little more than that, obviously. If it is moving away as a free particle, then EF is PF squared divided by 2M, which is, should be equal to the initial one, which is EI plus h bar omega. This is given. EI is known it is the innermost level, for instance. h bar omega is the energy brought in by the external radiation. And this is the free energy of the freely moving away electron. What is the value of the PF? Well, of square is given as such. But the direction of PF can be anything, no? Satisfying this equation. This is the equation of a two-sphere, right? A spherical surface. PF is coming out in all directions. Here is the momentum space of the free electron. Here are some PFs all having the same magnitude but moving away in different directions. So there are infinitely many final electron states. Okay, that's the first statement. There are infinitely many final electron states. Well, perhaps I have to ins insert here final free, satisfying that energy requirement. Uh -huh. If that is the case, then I have to consider the possibility of changing it from single to single to single to group. So replace this with rho E final and final energy is equal to EI plus H bar omega. I have warned you about this notation before saying that we have to use the proper label for the density of final states, saying that it is the final electron's density of states, a function of EF, but the energy conservation is to, has to be taken into account by writing EF equals to EI plus H bar omega. So that's again a good point to give another break. We will pick it up from here.